Uh, is this better? OK. Uh, so I wanted to start by giving a brief overview of what JLD actually is. Uh, probably most of you in this room, at least, are familiar with it. Uh, but just to give you an overview again, JLD stands for Julia Data. And the goal is to be able to take any Julia object that you have and save it in a format suitable for archival purposes. And so by archival purposes, I mean if you have a JLD file that you save today and you go and you go do something else for a few years and you come back and you try to read that data, you should still be able to do that. Uh, so there's one other way that you can save any Julia object to the disk, which is using the serialized function that's built into Julia itself. Um, but that serialized function has a very different goal, which is to basically send information between Julia processes. So if you have ephemeral data, then that's a good choice. But JLD is trying to meet a different goal. Um, so with JLD, the format is compatible across Julia versions. Uh, so you can still read JLD files that were written with older Julia versions. Um, and JLD also embeds the descriptions of your data structures. So even if you don't have the code that originally defined the types that you're saving to the disk, you can still read those objects out of your J JLD files. And JLD will actually go back and reconstruct the, the layout of those types. And finally, JLD is based on a standardized data format. So it's based on HDF5, uh, for which implementations exist to read these files, not only for Julia, but also for basically every language that's commonly used for scientific computing. Um, so JLD files are accessible not only to people using Julia, but also to people using other HDF5 implementations. So JLD2 makes several improvements to the functionality that was previously available in JLD. So the big change here is that I took JLD and I re-implemented everything in pure Julia. So JLD was previously writing HDF5 library or HDF5 files using the HDF5C library, but JLD2 actually writes HDF5 files in pure Julia code. Uh, as a result, we can get greatly improved performance for tuples and mutable objects, which were difficult cases for the old JLD code. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit more about that on the next slide. And we could also serialize types that JLD previously had trouble serializing. So most of the cases where JLD previously failed will now work in JLD2. Uh, to give you an idea of how fast JLD2 is, here's an example. So I'm creating a, a mutable struct called example type. Uh, and it has fields A, B, C, D, E, which are all numeric fields. And it's, it's critical for this example that this is mutable, because both JLD and JLD2 are very fast with immutable objects. Uh, but JLD is very slow with mutable objects. JLD2 is very fast with mutable objects. So I'm creating an array here with a, a, thousand, of, uh, a thousand objects of this type. And then I'm benchmarking how long it takes to write and to read it. So performance for writing is on the left. And performance for reading is on the right. And the y-axis is the amount of time it takes to do this in milliseconds. You can see that the bar for JLD2 is much lower, which means that it is much, much faster than JLD was at this case. And so it, it, it's actually not just faster than JLD. It's faster than Julia's built-in serializer. So this is a comparison with the serialized function in base. And you can see it's more than twice as fast in this example uh, than the built-in serializer for both writing and reading. And so you might ask, like, how, how is it possible to achieve this performance? So it, it seems like it should be harder to write HDF5 files than it is to write the files that serialize writes, because the files that serialize writes are in, in this under, unstandardized format that can be changed at will, whereas JLD2 is writing HDF5 files. Um, so there are a few reasons that this can be fast. So the first is that I'm no longer using the HDF5C library which was the real bottleneck behind JLD. It wasn't the format. It was the C library. Um, but on top of that, I'm also generating specialized code to save different object types. Uh, and this is a bit of a trade-off in that it means that it takes longer to compile uh, 
the first time around, the first time you save an object of a given type. But if you're saving a lot of objects, it can be much faster. And finally, I'm using memory maps IO to write this stuff to the, to the disk, which turns out to speed up the JLD cases uh, a lot. And I want to emphasize that JLD2 files really are still HDF5 files. Um, so here, I'm writing one instance of an object of this example type. Uh, I'm going to call it my amazing object. Uh, I write it to the disk. And then I run the h5ls command, which is included with the HDF5C library. And the h5ls command tells you what data is at the top level of the file. Here, there's a group called underscore types. A group is kind of like the HDF5 equivalent of a directory. And then there's the data set, my amazing object, uh, which is what we just saved. If we look at the output of the h5 dump command, which again comes with the HDF5C library, we see that it can determine the contents of that object. This object is saved in a bi binary format on the disk. But because the data structure description is saved in the file, it knows that it contains the fields 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, and if we look at what's in that types uh, group, things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, but what's going on here, so data type 1 is an HDF5 data type that represents a Julia data type. So a Julia data type has a name, which is a variable length string, and some set of parameters associated with it. And that's represented here. And then it also has an attribute called Julia type. The data type of this is the HDF5 representation of a data type, uh, just like the type of a data type. The, the type of data type in Julia is data type. Um, and it's called core.datatype, and it doesn't have any parameters. If we look at the second data type that's saved in the file, this is the representation of the example type. So you can see. It has the fields A, B, C, D, E, and they have the associated field types. For example, this is an int 8. Um, and it also has a Julia type attribute, which associates it with the, the type that was saved in Julia. In this case, it's just called example type, and again, no parameters. Um, so JLD is really saving HDF5. JLD2 is really saving HDF5 files that other implementations can read. Uh, JLD resolves a lot of, or JLD2 resolves a lot of issues that were present in JLD. So it, it's a combination of three types of issues here. Uh, there are performance issues. There are issues with uh, interactions between, between JLD and the HDF5C library. And then there are also issues where we couldn't write certain types because the implementation hadn't been adjusted to newer features in Julia. And now, now we can do all of that. Uh, so there are some limitations to JLD2. Uh, the first is that it can't read JLD2 files if they've been modified with other HDF5 implementations. And the reason for that is that JLD2 really only speaks a subset of HDF5. The actual full HDF5 specification is very complicated. But it turns out that we don't need all of it. Uh, you can't delete or modify existing data sets. Compilation times are long. At the moment, there's no support for compression or for groups. And I haven't tested this on Windows or 32-bit systems. Uh, but the biggest issue is that it's unreleased. And the reason it's unreleased is not that it doesn't work. It actually works pretty well, and it's pretty well tested. Uh, but the problem is that uh, if I release this to the world, people are going to use it. And people are going to use it for their vital data. And that, that means that it really needs a maintainer so that people don't end up losing their data. And at the moment, I'm not sure how much time I can commit to this. So if anyone here is willing to help me uh, maintain this ma package and push it across the finish line, that would be really great. So thank you.